this is in the news everywhere these days. Uh, I do a lot of harassment trainings for companies and it got to the point where I just didn't have time to continue to update the slide since there's something happening every single day. So I wanted to throw out some stats to start with. First one is 60% of women in tech report unwanted sexual advances. I actually was talking to a colleague of mine the other day and mentioned this stat and her response was, huh, I actually thought that would be a lot higher. I will say to these, this is focused on tech. Um, I work with a lot of other industries in the past. Um, I obviously work in the legal industry. I think these stats are pretty accurate across industry. Um, a lot of times we are focusing on tech um, with the harassment issues. Um, after the POW trial and everything, um, there's been a little bit of a microscope on Silicon Valley. Uh, but I, as we've seen with everything that's coming out these days, it is not just a tech problem, right? It's a problem for everywhere. Yeah. Sorry, you said trial? The POW trial. Oh, little POW. Yeah. Sorry. So, right, there was the, I think, a time cover about Silicon Valley during that time, right? It's really, really been uber focused on that. And then, obviously, the Harvey Weinstein stuff came out and, and things in other industries started really making waves. Uh, so it's been a little not quite as focused on the Valley as it was it, probably a couple years ago. Another thing we have, 60% uh, of women who do report are actually dissatisfied with the resolution. And then we have the issue with under-reporting, right? 39% said they didn't report because they perceived negative impacts. 30% didn't report because they wanted to move on. Um, the EEOC, uh, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they govern federal discrimination and harassment law. They've estimated that the underreporting is at least 75%. So 75% of harassment claims go unreported. So there's a lot of reasons folks don't report, right? Psychological impacts of harassment. Um, they're scared to report. They want to move on. Um, you know, they don't want to relive what happened. They're worried about getting people in trouble. Um, they don't think it's that big of a deal, right? So the issue companies are facing, one, how do we prevent harassment in the first place? Two, how do we get more victims or targets to actually come forward and tell us things are happening, right? If we don't know things are happening, we can't help prevent them. And three, how do we get other employees, bystanders, to tell us what's going on? And so I think we focused a lot on prevention and getting victims to report, and then we focused last on getting bystanders. I think we really need to reverse that, right? I think the key here is we can't have prevention if we don't know stuff is happening. So first, let's get bystanders to report. More bystanders reporting, more bystanders coming forward is going to get more targets coming forward and more people who are victims of harassment coming forward. Creates an atmosphere where people are comfortable saying things. And then once we have people actually reporting, we actually know how we can prevent. So I think focusing more on creating an atmosphere where people are comfortable coming forward as opposed to we have to prevent but having no idea what's going on, right? We can't get to prevention until we actually know what's happening there. Just a little bit of a legal basis. Uh, on the federal side, the laws we talk about with harassment, it's Title VII. That covers sex, it covers race, national origin. The ADEA is the Age Discrimination Act. If you are over 40, you fall under that. If you are under 40, you do not. ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then the California side, we just have one statute, makes it easy. It's all encompassing under FEHA, which is the Fair Employment and Housing Act. California covers sex, gender, um, gender identity. It covers transitioning, covers transgendered, covers a whole panoply of things under the sex category. So when we talk legal workplace harassment, it's one of these two things uh, from a legal perspective. Quid pro quo, um, probably less frequent. We call it economic harassment because it occurs when submission to or rejection of sexual conduct by an individual is used as a basis for an employment decision. So right, the most obvious is supervisor says, hey, um, come to dinner with me, go on a date with me, or you're not getting promoted, right? There's a lot more subtle forms of that, um, right? We have things like supervisor says, hey, why don't we go to dinner and discuss your career? 
this could be fine, or this could fall into a quid pro quo sexual harassment. It depends on the context of the dinner. It depends on the two people involved. Depends on the supervisor does this for everyone, or if this is a special thing, um, right? It depends on what's discussed at the dinner. So I, we think of quid pro quo as being really obvious. There's a lot of more subtle things that fall under that. Uh, but the most common, hostile work environment. The four legal prongs, unwelcome conduct, it's conduct because of a protected characteristic. So it has to be done because of one of those characteristics that are protected by those statutes. Severe or pervasive, such that a reasonable person would consider the workplace to be intimidating, hostile, or abusive. I want everyone to kind of have in the back of their minds that this is a legal framework for it, because you will get complaints in the workplace where someone says this is a hostile work environment. And you'll say, what happened? And it'll essentially boil down to the supervisor was asking that individual to do their job, <laughs> right? A lot of people use these buzzwords, and so it's good to have a sense of what these mean, but when you're working through inappropriate behavior in the workplace, we're not focused on if it hits every one of those metrics, right? You're not sitting there going, well, so I know this guy yelled profanities at you, but he does this with everybody. So it's not because you're a woman that he did this, so it's not a hostile work environment, so we don't have to worry about it, right? That's a defense for a lawyer, right, if you get sued. It's not a defense in the workplace, right? You still have to deal with these issues. So there's some changes on the legislative front that are happening. In the new tax bill, they inserted a provision where settlements that are related to sex harassment or sexual abuse are not tax deductible if there is a non-disclosure clause in there. They were before? They were. So settlements and lawsuits are tax deductible, typically. Um, we have now, right, so with the whole Me Too movement, there's increased idea that we don't want to silence people, right? We want this out in the open. So the idea behind this is let's remove, right, if you have a non-disclosure, you get a penalty because you don't get to deduct it. The question is, is, is this really a law that benefits people who are experiencing harassment, right? A lot of individuals, if you don't have a non-disclosure clause, you have, for better or worse, removed a company's incentive to settle, right? Companies are settling pre-litigation, pre-getting everything out there because they don't want everything out there, right? So if you have removed this incentive, companies are going to say, fine, litigate. Like, we'll, we'll do it. We have no incentive to because you can go and talk to the press anyway. You've now removed a benefit <laughs> that a lot of victims have experienced with harassment, right? Because a lot of them don't necessarily want to litigate, right? They don't want this in a public forum. And so the idea here, it's complicated, but the idea is here, yeah, maybe not having non-disclosure clauses in agreements is better for sort of the group, right? Because we get this out there, maybe we no, Harvey Weinstein is doing this before we do this time, but is it better for each individual person, right? Does each individual person really want to have to litigate these issues or would they like to settle these quietly and move on? But a lot of, a lot of the bills are focused on that. So California has maybe 10 different bills that are hanging out there that are trying to get passed this year. One prohibits mandatory arbitration for harassment claims. Again, the idea is harassment's private, and we don't want to force people into a private forum if they don't want to be. Um, I, I haven't read through the whole bill. I would hope that they would allow arbitration if, if the plaintiff wanted it, right? So that if they wanted to be in a private forum, they could, but the idea is they're not making it mandatory. Um, an extended statute of limitations from one to three years. Right now you have to sue within one year of when it happened. They want to extend that to three. Uh, Currently in California, every company that has 50 employees. That work for remote companies? It's a really great question. So how does it work for remote companies in terms of the training? More actually, how you? Training. I mean, how do you detect? How do? Uh, it's it's a really. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So one of the the oh, yeah. probably the largest issue for companies with dealing with these harassment claims is companies don't know things are going on a lot of times, right? Because we have remote employees. We have a lot of our workplace now taking place on Slack and other messaging systems. 
Um, not to just say Slack, it's the one I know off the top of my head. Um, you know, we have, when it was taking place on email, it was already hard, but it was easier to at least sort of monitor, right? There's not, people are on Slack all day, right? There's so many different channels. How employers have any idea what's going on there without someone notifying them? We have remote employees, right, who we never see. <laughs> so we can't gauge. Yeah, yeah, right. You may have absolutely never met this person. So one of the things I talk about in harassment training is, right, you know the people you work with, right? So a lot of times one of the things you can do as a supervisor is pay attention to people's reactions to things, right? And that can be a gauge as to if somebody's offended, how we handle it, you know, being more aware of that. When we have remote folks, we don't know anything about them, right? Like our entire experience with them is essentially like written communications. So we can't tell how they take jokes. We can't tell when they're offended by stuff. So if they're not coming forward and telling us things, obviously that's a problem. Like how do we vet those types of things? And one of it is, I don't know that bystander training really helps those situations, right? Because a lot of bystander is, it may be helpful if something offensive is said in, I was gonna say chat room, I feel like that dates me, um, in, in Slack or on a text messaging chain or in an email chain that somebody mentions it. So I think that's useful. Bystander training can be a little bit more sort of an in-person thing, you know, recognizing how you do it. Because if you see so many other people, um, see something you won't go and complain about it so the the best thing you can do honestly is i like to do sort of respect and dignity trainings in the workplace to you know sort of let's get off just saying the word harassment over and over again let's just talk about appropriate behavior in the workplace you know let's talk about diversity in the workplace um let's talk about there's a lot of issues now um transgendered issues um in california there's a lot of rules we have to follow right there's there's things not everybody in the workplace necessarily understands <laughs> right gender identity people who don't identify as male or female doing trainings to really get to the heart of that I think is one of the most crucial sort of platforms for getting people to one, speak up in preventing it from happening in the first place. So I, that to me is sort of the baseline. I, I really think mandatory harassment training is great, but when you hear the word harassment over and over and over again, people start to think of it as something bigger. Right, so a lot of the trainings I have people I think walk in and we talk about, yesterday I did, um, one of the new rules in California is if someone says, I want to go by this pronoun, you have to have them go by that pronoun, <laughs> right? I mean, it's stupid that that's a law. We should have just done that in the first place, but it is. And so I was talking about, you know, what do you do if someone has said, I want to go by this gender neutral pronoun, and you consistently hear a coworker calling them she, you know, and, and you've heard it multiple times. What do you do in that situation? And someone in the audience said, why is that a problem? It's like, well, it's, it's about respect for that individual. One, it could be legal harassment <laughs> if this is continuing to happen and if there's other things involved with that. Two, it's, it's really a respect issue, right? This person was asked to be called something and you are no longer, like you're not honoring those wishes, right? It's sort of like calling one of your subordinates chief or buddy <laughs> instead of by their name. <laughs> I feel like I feel like you're nervous about everything. I might use that every now and then. People do, right? But it's one of those things where if you call the same person over and over and over again, again, it might not be like legal harassment, but it's a matter of that person has a name. Am I respecting that or not? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, thinking about some people don't mind, right? It doesn't bother some people, but things like buddy can feel diminutive mm -hmm. to people, and if you're in charge of them. It, it can really have the effect of making them feel lesser and then making them potentially not come to you with things, right? So the idea is we want to create environments where people want to tell you there's issues or want to tell you, hey, stop calling me buddy, <laughs> right? And be willing to open up about that and creating sort of an open environment, um, you know, where you have that is, is the goal for these situations. Other questions? So, Sorry, I, yeah. Uh, so you did talk about that tonight on really the idea of under-reporting that happens. Yeah. 
and then so my I'm like, what? How do you juice that? So the legislation and stuff like that's coming out. The legislation, I think, is. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. It's really, that, that seems like one mechanism. It's not like the way to it. Are there any tips? And in my head, I'm like, is there anonymous channels? And how do you have that? And then how do you validate those things? That's so why I'm just curious. Anonymous channels are good. Um, I do think we see a bit of an uptick with reporting when we have that ability. Um, as dumb as this sounds, um, having a policy in place that's clear as to how complaints can be filed actually can help the underreporting issue, right? Um, I, it's, we all, like, you should have an employee handbook, um, right? Nobody reads the employee handbook. I spend a lot of time drafting them, but I know nobody actually reads them. <laughs> so don't just bury your complaint procedure in the employee handbook. It's something to maybe, like, at an all hands meeting, say, hey, we just want to go over if you have issues, here's who you talk to. And again, this not really from a legal perspective, but the person who they're talking to should be good at doing that, <laughs> right? They should be approachable, they should be good at handling these things because. I've seen a lot of issues where people don't want to come and talk to somebody because they've been shot down before, or they've heard other people have been shot down. Um, somebody in HR? Yeah, some supervisors of can be supervisors, could be HR. So I generally like to give people more than one person they can go to, right? They should always be able to go to their direct supervisor. So making sure supervisors sort of know how to handle these things. If you're a company who at this stage has HR, right, that's a great one. But again, making sure that person, because just because you're in HR doesn't necessarily mean you're good at handling these things, <laughs> right? Um, and I've seen it where people aren't good at it or a person has complained a bunch and they just want to shut down about those things. So making sure that we're taking in complaints in a very unbiased fashion does not mean a lot of the complaints you may take in may have no merit. But we want to be open to taking them in and open to listening to all sides to sort of help with that underreporting. Um, I think another thing that can help with the underreporting is honestly other people reporting. Right? When we have, if something happens to me and my coworker goes and reports and things are handled well, that may help somebody come forward. Sometimes that person is mad at them for saying something, right? Because they don't want it out there, they don't want to deal with it, but other people can see that. Um, and, and seeing how things are handled really helps with the reporting issues. And we're never, due to sort of all of the psychological issues <laughs> with people who actually experience harassment, that underreporting number is not going to change that much. Um, I was at a labor and employment conference <laughs> earlier uh, a couple months ago and we were talking about these issues and they asked all the panelists in in 10 years where do you think we are going to be and all the panelists said probably the exact same place w which in in part is probably true like we've been in this place for a while um, you know none of this stuff to employment people is new right we've been dealing with this and handling this for 20 30 40 years uh, and I don't, I, I just don't think we can do a lot on the underreporting. I think if we can get it to 50%, that's a victory. That's like a huge victory on reporting. So you really have to empower the people who see it to do more of the reporting um, because that's really going to be the best way to do it. We just, I don't think it's fair to put the onus on the people who are experiencing it given what it, given the psychological impacts to put the onus on them entirely to report it. I mean, legally it is, right? But I think when we're talking about how we fix these problems, we're just never going to get those people to report as much. Yeah? Since you're getting into conjecture and away from yeah. law, um, I saw, I guess what gives me hope, I guess I would say, as you talk about yeah. 10 years, I saw Jennifer Heinlein, uh, the uh, founder and CEO of Front the Runway, speak yeah. days ago. And uh, she was talking more about diversity mm -hmm. and harassment, but her point was you know, woman-led business, yep. but with, with multiple women founders, but the original 10 people had a very, very complete set of diversity, genders, races, yep. uh, orientations, and so forth, and, and even nationalities. Uh, and her point was because they found it that way, not by yeah. design, it just that it grew that way, yep. and there's never had to be a diversity initiative. Because they've always because had culturally, it. Culturally, yeah. it began that way, and I, part of her point was 
changing a culture of a company that grew up differently is much, much harder, if not impossible, yeah. than starting with that foundational as to who you are. But what's interesting to me is I am seeing more companies, you know, we're a lot of startups here, yeah. that are starting differently and thinking about it differently from the beginning and, you know, you know what what will be interesting. I'm curious if you think it's true or if human nature will get in the way. If that if more of that happens, does ten years from now give us an opportunity to have more larger companies I think that are setting examples and showing up as That is a great point. Um, I think if you do start that way, you do have an impact. I, at some point, you reach such a size where we can't necessarily, right? There's going to be people on the lower level who maybe, or within any level, that don't necessarily carry all of the company values. But when you have all of the people around you doing the right things, you tend to have other people doing the right things. And I think all of the stuff we've seen come out about these really um, corrupt environments, it's because a lot of from top down were the issues. And if you get sort of the top right, and that means board, means investors, means executives, it means your managers, if you get that right, you have a much better chance. We're not gonna get rid of these claims, <laughs> right? It's not gonna happen, but you have a much better chance of succeeding on that front. Um, I totally agree with that. And I think another point too, having, having diversity, is it also can really help on these factors, right? When you have people who have experienced harassment, who have experienced discrimination at the top who can talk about it, it makes a big difference um, you know, for the people below. And right, I think a lot of you know, my male friends were like shocked by some of the things that were coming out. And I spoke to all of my female friends and none of them were surprised, right? So having people who've had experiences in this area can make a big difference. What's my time? Uh, I mean, it's, it's five minutes, but you don't <laughs> Like, get out, get out. Well, it'll be like three hours from now. Um, so I'll just say, uh, just a few, and we've already talked about a lot of this stuff. Um, getting your policies in place, training people, having engaged executives, investors, and boards, right, who are engaged in the business, but engaged on these issues. Um, right, who are talking about these issues, who are invested in these issues, who move quickly when there are complaints. And look, there's a lot of complaints that come in and I deal with that aren't founded, <laughs> right? Not every complaint that comes in is actually gonna be like anything we have to deal with, but we have to handle it so that the person feels like we listen to them. Now, it may be something we find has no merit, but we still have to deal with it. So that's sort of the key with taking complaints in. Because you may know when you hear from a person, they just don't like their supervisor, or the supervisor doesn't like this individual. Like we don't have any legal issue here. You still got to walk through the steps to make everyone feel like they were heard. Um, conscious inclusion uh, is something we talk a lot about unconscious bias. And maybe we talk about it a little too much instead of talking about consciously actually including people. Like we spend a lot of time trying to figure out where our bias is instead of spending more time consciously including people from different backgrounds and consciously making an effort towards diversity. Um, and so thinking about that, unconscious bias training is great, don't get me wrong, but I think thinking what can we actually do with that, right? So now, <laughs> now I figured out what my unconscious bias is, now what do I do, right? And so really, really focusing on consciously making efforts on that front. Anybody have questions? I like how you framed up both that point of conscious inclusion as well as not just calling something harassment training but more teaching respect and dignity. Yeah. It's really about like, it's a very kind of um, progressive way of looking at it. It's, it's focusing on the things you want to build versus mm -hmm. the things you want to stay away from. It, when you keep telling people what they can't do, yeah. they don't really listen. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's really like, legally we have to do the harassment training and we have to fit certain things in, but legally we don't have to call it anything specific. We just have to, right, we have to do the right things. We have to tell people, you know, what they need to be doing here. We have to train people on these issues. I also feel like if you build that way, then, and people, and, and it supports people making decisions around yep. those, those, that framework, it naturally might diminish the yeah. adverse effect, yeah. right? Like, totally true. Keep people focus on what you want, how you want them yeah. to be. Better judgment versus yeah. uh, handling conflict resolution. Right. Yes. Both. Yes. Okay, teach them how to make better decisions. Yeah.
Right, like we need to know conflict resolution, but if our only focus is conflict yeah. resolution, we've already missed the idea of avoiding the conflict in the first yeah, place. Totally. So, and, and I've seen, you know, to your point before, companies that build the right way from the beginning, I get less calls about, like they don't have to call me as much, <laughs> right? Companies who have sort of ignored some of these issues, they're some of my better clients, right? They, they have more issues on these types of things. So really focusing on the culture that you're building and how you're treating employees can go a long way in prevention here. I'm all set. <laughs>